much, John. Glad you uh, joined us today. My it's pleasure. Be a fun flight. Oh man, I'm excited. It's real nice. Um, yeah, so we're, we're gonna go up, and we've got a, a, a super long flight all the way to Dublin. We're gonna cross the pond. Right on. And when I say pond, I mean Lake Grandberry, <laughs> which is literally a pond. Yeah, it is. And uh, 20 minutes to Dublin, Texas. <laughs> All right, so John, Tailwind Advisors, tell us all about it. Oh man, Keith, Tailwind is a company that you guys and I started about 14 years ago. Uh, we work as a multifamily investment office. We, we work for 10 ultra high net worth families. Okay. Uh, and we manage their investment portfolios from, from soup to nuts, from, from cash to venture capital. We build long-term diversified portfolios and, uh, and, and if you look at like what's the reason we exist, you know, it is to steward our clients' wealth and simplify their lives. You know, a, a lot of people think, well, wouldn't it be great to have a ton of money? And yeah, maybe in some ways it would, but it certainly adds a lot of complexity yeah. to life. Yeah, super complicated life, right? Yeah, you know, through a long series of uh, jobs that kind of led up to it. I went to University of Texas, worked in banking for Hook'em Horns. Hook'em Horns. <laughs> went worked for Bank of America for my first job. Loved it. Uh, went back to business school at Texas again. Didn't get in anywhere else I applied. I've tried some uh, top-notch schools. The reason I like to tell that is because it's a shout-out to my wife, because I think I was meant to go back to Austin and meet my wonderful wife. I was actually having this conversation with my son last night who's applying to schools, and I was like, "Nice, hey, dude, if, if I'd gotten in some of these reach schools, I w you wouldn't be here right now, so don't put too much pressure on yourself. <laughs> um, but so I was working for American Airlines in an economics role. You know, kind of, I was responsible for the every flight westbound out of the DFW hub. All right, so complexity in... Uh Infrastructure and cybersecurity and IT, especially in, in, in your position, right, with financial services, is that getting harder or is that getting easier? Man, Keith, I, it's getting harder. I mean, we, as you know, we wouldn't be sitting here right now if I wasn't really worried about cybersecurity because yeah. that was how we got to know each other was us continuing to search for the best solutions for that. I, mean, I, I remember 10 years ago when our IT provider at the time showed me where on our main server you know, we had a Chinese IP address hitting it once every second, trying to guess the admin password. That got my attention in a big way. Oh, yeah. Just realizing that because of who we are and because of what we do, we were a target. I've said before with my partners, we, we've had, you know, we have strategic meetings, and one of the things we always have talked about is what more can we be doing to protect the confidentiality of our client information? And it just, uh, it, I can sleep with $1.3 billion of investment risk, I sleep like a baby. That doesn't keep me up at night. But what does are the risks that I can't control. And cybersecurity, I think, if I look at kind of fundamental risks to my business and to my clients, that's that's one of them. So that's something where we've always said we're going to do whatever it takes to do the best job we can here. It's a small number of entrepreneurs like yourself that take cybersecurity that seriously, like understanding what's at stake, understanding the risk. Ours is a trust-based business at the end of the day. Our clients trust us to do a great job, and confidentiality is one of our core values. So we can do that from a human standpoint all day long, but if from a technical standpoint we violate that confidentiality because we didn't have a good posture defensively and somebody hacks in, that's, that's, a, you know, that's a fundamental risk to our business. Yeah, right on. So, John, uh, what is it that people really most misunderstand about your business and what you do? Yeah, you know, I, I think, Keith, what, what most people want in a financial advisor is, is, is like a fortune teller. It's like someone who's going to look in the crystal ball and say, this is what I know is going to happen. So let's position your portfolio 
in such a way as to take advantage of it. The fact of the matter is, when you look at the data on the value of forecasting, it's almost nil. Like, there are very few people in the world who repeatedly come up with a good forecast, and then even harder than that, even if you had one, to trade on it is another hard thing. So I tell my clients, our goal is to build diversified, long-term oriented portfolios that are robust against my ignorance of not knowing the future. Wow. You know, because it's, most people want to trade. They want a stock tip. They want something. And, and when you're managing wealth over the long run, all my clients have more money than they will spend in their lifetime. It is, it's intergenerational wealth. It's for their kids, their grandkids, their foundation, wherever it's going. Uh -huh. So when, you're, when you have that kind of time horizon, one, you can't do it, and two, there's no need to try and forecast what's just down the road and move around it. Got it. So you're, you're in for the long haul, and you're really you're, you're, you're zooming out. You're looking at the big picture. You're 50,000 foot up. I'm okay. not a pilot yet. <laughs> but but um, it'd be like watching right in front of the plane versus watching the horizon. Yeah. Like it's, it's a, you're not going to get where you're going if you're constantly making short-term course corrections. Yeah, yeah. Right on. Yeah, you don't want to look down at your track and it's uh, zigzag, zigzag. Right. Make, a, <laughs> make a point and go for it. Yeah, very cool. John. All right. Look at this bad boy. Look at this. We get to go arrest people. Drive a police car. Yes. <laughs> does it open? It does. Oh, it does. Score. Nice. Uh, you think there's a siren on it? Think we can uh, well, well, phone some the, people? We got the light. Oh. I can, I can, yeah. Very nice. I can blind somebody. Yeah, this looks um, like this could be a scary ride. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, no. I don't see a shotgun or anything, but I think we'll still have fun. Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right, John. We're in uh, we're in pursuit of some perps here. Yeah. Uh, Central. This is uh, Unit Two. We are uh, on approaching East Blackjack Street in hot pursuit of uh, coffee. Hot Over. pursuit of coffee. Over. It says the parking brakes on. There's no anti lock brakes, and it has a low tire. But All right. After physical inspection, I don't believe any of those to be true. <laughs> Actually, I haven't tested the ABS yet. It's good. We did a full pre-flight of this. <laughs> I just made sure the tires were not completely flat. It's good. It's good. Seems that uh, we have a bit of a roadblock. I want to use my authority as an officer of the law to try and commandeer this train, but I may have to. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, John, lights and yeah. sirens. This is straight up Duke's a hazard here. Get the bow and arrow. <laughs> Well done on the driving, John. Way Thank to you. go. Way to go. Got around that train. Yep. Got to get our bags. Got any perps in here? Nope. Dropped them off already. Yep. Book them, Dano. <laughs> The entrepreneurial world is full of uh, bumps, right? Surprises that that hop up. Like, what are some challenges that have uh, popped up that you were, really didn't anticipate? You know, the the thing that comes to mind about unexpected things is really kind of how we've marketed the firm, or more specifically, not marketed the firm. So, I guess when I started a business, I imagined that we'd have to do a whole lot of calling on people and getting out there and, you know, sponsoring golf tournaments and whatever I thought marketing was at the time. But as it turns out for our business and for our clients, it has been 100% word of mouth. Wow. So we have not, that's we, rare. We joke <laughs> internally that we are really bad at marketing, Yeah. Um, but we're really good at what we do. And that's so awesome. we usually just lead with that. And when we're talking to people, it's like, Hey, this, 
you're not going to get a good marketing pitch here. If you want a good pitch, there's plenty of places you can go, but we're going to give you a better result. Very cool. Uh, yeah. So, so John, how does Telwin Advisors make the world a better place? Yeah, great question. So Keith, a few ways come to mind. Uh, first is like, we have 17 people on our staff. We work hard to have a good work environment, a great culture, and, and it does feel a lot like family. So, you know, in that sense, I always think of kind of that, that obligation and that the benefit of, of providing your great work environment and employment to 17 people. So yeah, that certainly that, makes the world that, a better place. That's just, awesome. Just creating economic growth. But yeah, I know, I know when you and I met, like that's one of the things that really connected our companies is just the the similarity in culture, right? The, yeah. the focus on family, on, on faith, and really just working for a greater purpose and yeah. serving the world, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, also, certainly, we, we create wealth, right, for our clients. That increases the economic benefit in and around Fort Worth and for our families. And so there's all kinds of good that you know, I, I believe economic good is a real thing as well. So the last thing that I'd say we do to make the world a better place is through a new business that we started a couple of years ago called Tailwind Philanthropic Advisors. And okay. so what Tailwind Philanthropic exists to do is to, to elevate giving. So we work for all of our families. They all have private foundations and they're all very generous. But running those private foundations, it turns out, is a lot of work and there's a lot of complexity there too. From figuring out what they're passionate about giving to, to doing due diligence on groups to receive charitable contributions, to running board meetings, um, to filing IRS tax returns and doing the accounting, it's a lot of work there. And so we created Tailwind Philanthropic to step into that gap and basically just put the fun back in giving and do all the work behind it. So we're doing that for our current families, but we are also looking for other folks to do that for as well. That's fantastic. So so you're, you're really as as you elevate wealth for the clients that you serve, that, that funnels back into the, the people that need it, right? The people that are most impacted by giving. Correct. Right. And, yeah. and, and you're evaluating uh, who those people are and what those uh, organizations, how lean they're running and whether they're running a good program. And we right. hired a couple of fantastic people to run that. Um, Macy Hill and Christina Desmond both have deep experience in the nonprofit world. And they've got the exact right skill set to uh, to accomplish that goal. So, John, where you, where do you see the company going? Where from here? Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's been so much fun to get it to this point. We've got capacity to take on and work for at least a few more families. Um, the business is very scalable, and that's obviously that's good for us, but it's also good for our clients in that, you know, one of the fundamental things that a Tailwind client would evaluate before they engaged us is, should I just start my own family office, right? And there's a level of wealth where that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I think that's probably somewhere north of half a billion dollars, um, but you have to hire a lot of staff. And we, we have, like I said, 17 people. We've got a lot of overhead because we've hired a lot of great people and none of our clients would really want to spend all that on their own office, but they're happy to share in it. So one benefit is it's a cost sharing model, right? And they have they have access to more people and more expertise than they would otherwise. Gotcha. You're you're, you're kind of explaining DKB's I was value that, yeah. prop too, right? right. Uh, that yeah. that model to where it's hard to afford the best of the best to have all of these all of these experts on your own payroll. Right. But to be able to leverage that expertise across. It's and, really similar. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we would never. We might hire an IT guy, but we would never hire the kind of depth that you've hired. Yeah. Hard to find a security expert hard to find a service desk expert, a strategic IT person to, to bring those all together under one roof, you, you would have a lot on your payroll. And similarly, it sounds like um, you've got a lot of different disciplines. Maybe tell us about what those different disciplines are within your company that you offer your clients. Yeah, sure. So we've got, um, boy, we have four CPAs. We got four chartered financial analysts, CFAs. So we've got an investment team of um, six. We've got investment ops team of two. Uh, we have a financial control group, which like does all the accounting and back office of, uh, of three. We've got an in-house real estate expert who helps us. We do a lot of direct investments in real estate. So we have an in-house real estate guy. Uh, and then we also have uh, a team who we partnered with whose offices with us to do our energy investing. So we are active in buying uh, mineral interests, royalty interests. And so wow. So we've got a very diverse team there, something that would be really hard to, to recreate on your own. 
Yeah, yeah. So, like, like you said, it's it, it, it's maybe it's more of an art than a science, <laughs> For sure. but a really complicated art. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so back to your original question, though, like, where do we go from here? So there, one benefit of Tailwind is this cost sharing idea, but the other is this what we call hunting in a pack. Right. So as we continue to grow, it lets our clients do a better job hunting in a pack. And what do I mean by that? So we always say internally, like a wolf couldn't kill a moose, but a pack of wolves could kill a moose. So if you had one family office and you had just your money to diversify it, you'd have to take smaller bites, smaller asset allocations of each thing you did. Right. Mm -hmm. If but if you join together with 10 other families who have a similar amount of money, then the amount of, of investment in each opportunity gets bigger. So why is bigger better? One, it lets us negotiate fees on behalf of our clients, which we're really good at. Um, and two, that scale gets you into better investment opportunities than you might have by yourself. I got you. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, no, it, it, it kind of works the same way in IT, right? With, with DKB is uh, being able to scale up a level of talent and to be able to get like the best of the best when it comes to IT, cybersecurity, uh, specifics around infrastructure, uh, you know, we're able to get a lot more bang for your buck from the client. You, obviously, you've, you've seen that, right? Mm-hmm. To be able to um, attract the talent and, and grow that talent since it's right. always moving, always adapting to technology, current cyber threats. Um, hard to put that on your own payroll and hard to attract the type of talent that would want to work for a small company to, to be able to have the opportunity to to work for for DKB means you know working across multiple companies, multiple industries, financial services like your own. You know, another parallel is that the world is getting more complicated, right? It so is. it's harder to <laughs> find somebody, even if you could find someone who's a subject matter expert in everything, they'd probably be too expensive to hire, and they wouldn't be able to get the job done because there's too much to do. You know, so the investment world is getting more complex and you need a depth of team there, just like the IT world is getting more complex and you need a, a depth of team there. And yeah, that's absolutely why we chose to partner. With yeah, it makes sense. A lot, a lot of parallels within mm-hmm. our companies. So, John, what do you do for fun, man? Like, it's got to be stressful what you do. Uh, how, how do you kick back? Okay, well, I have more hobbies than I have time. Uh, Sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. So, yeah, the main thing I do is chase around three kids, go to sporting events. I've got a senior in high school, a, a sophomore in high school, and a seventh grader. So, I spend a lot of time being a dad, which I absolutely love. Um, when I have a free moment, I am exercising. So, I love to run, I love to swim, I love to bike. My happiest place is probably on a mountain bike in Colorado. Really? So, I ride a lot around here, but I love riding in Colorado. But I just like the. Uh, it's downhill, uphill. Both, Everything? both, not both, okay. not lift served. I don't do the uh, I don't do the ski lift served. Yeah, but it's fun, um, but it's <laughs> I like to earn it. So you know, yeah. we'll, we're, I love I just love the how you have to be kind of lost in the moment there. You have to be paying so much attention to what you're doing. There's nowhere else in your brain to for other thoughts to crowd in. So yeah, the flying is the same thing, right? Yeah, right. A lot of focus, especially if you're in busy airspace or navigating the weather. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I absolutely love the mountains as well. Now you've mentioned uh, skiing. Do you ski or snowboard or? I'm a skier. I, I love right. to ski. And you know, we hit the point a few years ago, you know, probably six years ago now, where all the kids could ski. So the five of us yeah. and my wife, I should say, is a beautiful skier. So that was one of the that was one of the first things that drew me to her. Is we ended up on the same ski trip, and I couldn't believe how well she could ski. Nice. Um, so we spent a lot of time in Crested Butte. And I just adore it. And, you know, talk about evaluating risk. I mean, so I do that with my son now, who's, you know, he's the 17, 18 year old who wants to ski the whole mountain and can. He's a great skier. You know, so we're doing the hike in skiing. We're doing the steep, steep powder when it's there. But, uh, you know, I'm still probably the only dad who will go ski with the kids when they want to do that stuff. So that's a lot of fun. We talk a lot about risk management in this conversation right and we talked about uh the risk of being an entrepreneur and uh certainly the risk in cybersecurity and it and evaluating like what's acceptable risk um or where do you need to invest in in mitigation yeah. so 
I, I guess what's your overall view on risk management? What do you what do you try to teach your kids? Yeah, that's a great it? question. Well, you know, there's a concept in investing called risk adjusted return, right? So it and it's a it's a form of cost benefit analysis, but it's like you can't just look at how much money you could make in a deal. You have to really multiply that by the probability of loss, right? So okay. you know, it's I kind of when I'm talking to my kids, I'm like, don't just think about what you could get by doing that or something. And don't just think about the risk of doing something. Mm -hmm. Think about both. Right? When you fly an airplane, you're taking risks that, that don't exist if there's if you haven't right. put all that space beneath you. But that's an educated risk. And when you look at the data, it's probably no less safe than driving a car. But yeah. you're still stacking risks because you're driving a car as well. So it's just it's just working. It's calculated, it's yeah, different. Exactly. Right? Yeah. In business, always risks, right? Risks of in hiring, that there are risks, right? Do you, how do you invest in scaling your team? Do you hire more people? Do you do you stay lean and try to just gut through it? <laughs> right. Um, we're always taking risks. It's just part of business, right? But you know, one of the things when you look at interviews with older folks at the end of their life, one of the things they'll say is, I wish I had taken more risk. Wow. I wish I hadn't played it safe. And I've, I heard that early. And I've, listen, I mean, certainly before kids, I took a lot of risks. I was a rock climber. I've climbed big mountains. I've, you know, driven driven cars on courses. I've done all kinds of fun stuff, and I love it. I feel you feel super alive when yeah. you're doing those things. Same. I did twist down that risk level a little bit when I became a dad, um, but then you kind of build it back up and learn to do it again. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the sweetness of life. There, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> getting that adrenaline pumping. Yeah. life goals not related to work mm. like what's what's on your bucket list good question i still there's still some mountains out there i want to climb um i want to climb kilimanjaro nice um yeah which, my, which is, my brother my uh sister-in-law just did kilimanjaro okay and see it it's it's, it's doable right it's tough yeah. but it's non-technical like 195 hmm. i'm probably not tough. strapping on strapping on my crampons or using my ice axe anymore but i'd still love to do some big mountains that are effect that are okay. hikes and to do it with the kids Okay. Have you climbed any 14ers? I've climbed a lot of 14ers. Really? I, I love okay. climbing in Colorado. I've done some climbing in Mexico. Climbed uh, El Pico de Orizaba. It's the tallest point in Mexico. Okay. It's a, it's a glacial peak that, as I recall, is like 18,700. That's nice. probably the most alive I've ever felt. Yeah. You know? Nice. Well, the uh, bucket list item for me is to uh, fly, fly to the Bahamas. Oh, yeah. wanna, that's about a 30 minute flight from Miami Executive flying to Nassau. So would you hop all the way across um, the Southeast to Miami yeah. and then go? Yeah, Ooh, yeah I'd like to give that a try. Let's talk a little bit about cybersecurity, John. Yeah. So, uh, man, the world is getting complicated with ransomware on the rise, uh, all of these attacks going on. I guess what, what's something that you've seen really change and threats that have that come up that you just wish you didn't have to deal with oh man yeah well yeah i wish we lived in a world where everyone was nice to each other and no one wanted to steal my information or my clients yeah, information. it'd be a lot easier right yeah, I would. but i mean just just seeing the, the the threats the attacks you know growing and seeing companies who people thought they could trust getting hacked you know seeing password managers getting hacked seeing you know large companies who I know are spending a lot of money. Uber, right? Yeah. Like like multiple attacks. Yeah. So it just makes you nervous when you know they're spending a lot and they're still getting hacked. So, you know, I mean, we've implemented a lot. I mean, I think two-factor was a big step forward for us. We did that, you know, gosh, early. We did that maybe eight years ago. Um, yeah. I just love the idea that nobody can get in without knowing who they are. Um, but also the outsourced securities operation, security operation center, mm -hmm. our SIM. Right. Yep. That that has been a great tool. It's you know it's funny because uh, you know if somebody goes on a trip and they're in Mexico and they log in, it's flagged, and I got somebody calling me saying, "Is this okay?" Which I love. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So having that Overwatch is nice. It's expensive, right? It's it is complicated. Expensive. It's expensive. You, you wish you didn't have to have uh, your house full of cameras and full of burglar alarms. Like you wish you could just leave the door unlocked, but. Uh, 
business is tough and uh, people want to get in, right? Absolutely. So got to so, have that monitoring, that overwatch in place. Well, and, and you know that's why that's why our firms are working together. That was the driving force of of us looking around and saying. We need to do an even better. We were doing a good job, but I was like, good is not good enough on here. We want to do the best job we can do here. Yeah, there's too much at risk, right? Absolutely. And, and, you know, I commend you just for, like, for being an entrepreneur that really takes cybersecurity seriously, that understands what's at stake. Yeah, my business is at stake because confidentiality is a core value at Tailwind. And our clients know that, and we're really good at being confidential. But that's all for naught if somebody hacks in and gets a hold of that information. Yeah, so backing that up, putting the right systems in place right. to, to really stand behind your core values. I mean, that's, that's awesome.